Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Again, I'm sorry, but this will be now the fifth time I give my little introduction, um, but just for anyone who joined. So hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us again. I am Jackie Brenner, a pre-med student who has enjoyed meeting other STEM students from around the world through my TikTok and Discord STEM Potential. It has been almost a year now since we started STEM Potential, which is an online Discord that provides a network for all students to share their unique perspectives from diverse backgrounds and create strong connections and more. With over 12,000 students from over 105 different countries, Discord members can act as mentors and mentees as they progress along the stages of their education, while also finding friends with common interests. I would like to give a shout out to the members of the STEM Potential team for working so hard to help make this possible. I created these STEM Potential webinars in order to combat the lack of mentorship and representation that I noticed in STEM fields. Lastly, I'd like to introduce Ashini. She is the Vice President of STEM Potential, who I met through the seven-year BSMD program at Penn State in Jefferson, and is now a first-year medical student. I could not embark on this journey without her, and I feel so fortunate and proud to have her as my best friend. <laughs> we will both be moderating these sessions, as you guys know, um, and we'll be moderating the last portion of the session today. I am proud and humbled to have assembled a group of incredibly successful medical students. Please note that today we are sharing students' opinions and advice about the medical school admissions process. We have not received any direct information from admissions departments, nor are we an official accredited business in this space. This session will be highlighting five amazing um, Yale medical students that all have unique perspectives and stories on how they were accepted into medical school. Now I wanna start off by allowing each panelist to give us a two to three minute introduction. So Danielle, can you start us off? Of course, Jackie, you know, thanks a lot for organizing this panel. And I'm really excited to talk to you all in this capacity today. Um, so, as some of you might know, I am a seventh year MD PhD student at Yale, and I originally am from New uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, where I completed my bachelor's degree in biology um, and with a minor in biochemistry. And essentially, uh, you know, my background is that I personally had dealt with kind of some uh, depression and anxiety as a teenager, which really got me interested in learning more about the brain. Um, through my research in undergrad, I realized that what I really was interested in is understanding more about how different pharmacological agents interact with our brain and environment to kind of produce the experiences and other things that we interpret. Um, and essentially, you know, that path has led me to really, you know, being interested in things as diverse as the brain tumor microenvironment to uh, functional neurosurgery and brain machine interfaces. Um, as far as kind of my background goes, you know, beyond that, uh, you know, I've been doing my PhD now for what is on its fifth year. Um, I hope to finish my PhD in genetics this year. Um, and then after that, I will go back to medical school and essentially, uh, you know, finish up my clinical time where I, where I hope to match into neurosurgery. Um, and, you know, beyond that, I do kind of honestly too many, too many things outside of, uh, of the research that I'm involved in right now, but all of them have a, a similar flavor. And that is basically my interest in both uh, biotech and also like community um, engagement activities and, and kind of it, increasing diversity and other things in medicine and STEM more generally, but also within the biotech space and neurosurgery. Um, yeah, I would say that that kind of sums it up for me. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. So happy to have you. Um, and maybe Gabby, you can go next. Yeah, um, I'm Gabby. I'm originally from Sao Paulo, Brazil. So I'm an international student. So I don't know like if we're gonna give out our contact information later, but if anyone wants to talk about being an international student, definitely hit me up. Um, I went to Brown University for undergrad and I studied cognitive neuroscience there. I absolutely loved it. Uh, I did a lot of research at the sleep lab. Um, so I looked at a lot of different things within sleep, especially sleep in kids that have ADHD. And then I stayed at Brown to do my master's. And now I'm a second year at Yale. And I just started my clerkships a few weeks ago. And I'm in surgery now, so I've been pretty busy. But um, I'm really enjoying everything. Being in the hospital is so fun. 
and outside of school, I do, um, I'm doing psychiatry research in bipolar disorder, a little bit similar to what I did in undergrad with ADHD, but now looking at sleep and bipolar disorder. And I am part of the Addiction Medicine Collaborative. So like studying um, addiction medicine and addiction psychiatry and just like a general interest group for students. I also was in the psychiatry um, interest group last year, but now, now I've just been doing a lot of the hospital stuff. So not as involved with the extracurriculars. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much it. Awesome, well, thank you. Uh, maybe Ariel, you can go next. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Arielle. I'm originally from Los Angeles area. Um, I'm a first year right now at Yale in the MD program. And my background was a bit varied and non-traditional. Um, I went to University of Pennsylvania and studied criminology and Hispanic studies. Um, basically took enough science to fulfill the minimum graduation requirements. Didn't think I was gonna go into medical school um, and thought I was gonna go into the legal field, worked in that for a while um, and kind of realized that that wasn't where I actually wanted to end up. So I went back because I was still working and living in Philadelphia, went back to Penn, took my pre-med classes while I was still working. Um, and then I eventually did my master's in human nutrition at Columbia and went back to working again and then ended up at Yale in the MD program. Um, I had also actually originally applied to most programs um, as an MD PhD applicant um, in the social sciences, humanities, public health arena, was fortunate enough to get accepted into a couple MD PhD programs at other universities um, and the MD program here at Yale and for a variety of reasons, which uh, I think will be coming up in a question a little bit later on, I decided to do the MD program here at Yale. And I'm very, very happy that I did. Um, as far as other activities that I'm involved in um, and kind of interests, uh, very much involved in orthopedics, specifically orthopedic trauma, um, social determinants of health, access to care, um, especially among Spanish speaking and lower income or vulnerable populations. Um, as well as leadership in the Medical Student Council at Yale and probably a couple other things that I'm forgetting right now. So I think that about sums it up. Well, thank you so much. So excited to talk more about uh, why you chose MD. Um, maybe next, Olamide. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. And I apologize for having my camera off. My internet connection is not the most stable. Uh, but my name is Alameda, you can call me Ala. I am originally from Nigeria, where I currently am. So I'm actually, it's like 10 p.m. where I am right now, <laughs> like six hours ahead of everyone. Um, and this is en route a um, global health elective that went on in Ghana. So I'm just here for the weekend and I'll return to Ghana for the rest of the month. Um, and I'm a fourth year at Yale. Um, I was, I'm originally from Nigeria, except that I went to college in Florida Smith College in New York, Arkansas, so very small HBCU. So if everyone, anyone has questions about coming from a college with less than 700 students, I'm totally happy to answer. Um, I took two gap years doing research. I did not far away in Boston. So I was doing research in cancer immunology. Um, and it was actually very productive. I was able to get some publications from that. Um, and since being at Yale, I had very varied interest in research. So most of my research has been based off of um, quality improvements as well as some diversity type research. So um, I was originally interested in plastics, so I did some plastic surgery research, um, but then eventually decided on urology, so I also have some urology research as well. So um, I've gone through like interviews and all of that stuff and hoping to match on Tuesday. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, outside of that, um, I'm also interested in global health, which is why I'm doing this now. Also an international student. So I am one of the co-founders of International Students in Medicine. So um, we have a website, and we have to check that out or talk to anybody about applying to medical school and even residency as an international student. I'm also one of the co-founders of um, something called Health Smart, which is a health literacy platform um, in, that we do here in West Africa with a friend of mine. Um, I see someone asking if they can see me. My camera is off, I apologize, um, but that's my picture. Um, yeah, I'm happy to up to any other questions you have. Oh, also since being at Yale, I've been involved in like the Avon Free Clinic. I'm very, as one of the coordinators of the um, HPREP program, which is a pipeline program for high school students here at Yale. 
heavily involved with SNME, I wanna say, I'm very passionate about that stuff, like increasing diversity and inclusion in medicine. So yeah, happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you so much for starters for even joining this webinar. We're so happy to have you and I'm definitely going to get all of that information after in terms of the other organizations you're involved in as it's such a great opportunity for other students. And I definitely want to dive into with um, um, about international students in terms of applying because I did get a lot of emails about that. Uh, last but not least, Jafar. Hi, everyone. I'm Jafar. I am a third year uh, MD, PhD student at Yale. Um, for my background, I am from um, Jordan. I moved to the US as an adult. Um, I was 19. Uh, I took two gap years before starting undergrad, um, worked all kinds of random things, worked at a dry cleaners, um, worked as a delivery driver, and then um, went to undergrad at UC Irvine, where I majored in um, microbiology and immunology. Um, after undergrad, I did two years of post -bac research at the NIH, um, looking at mechanisms of um, autoimmune disease and um, autoimmunity. And um, after that, I um, came here to Yale. Um, right now, I just started my PhD about six months ago, um, also continuing in autoimmune disease, where I look at um, kidney dysfunction in um, lupus nephritis. And um, I also do a lot of work at Yale with the ethics committee at our hospital, um, looking at end of life care and, um, and decision making for patients that lack um, decision making capacity. Um, outside of school, and because of my background, I'm really um, interested in um, providing help and um, assistance to people that are that had um, um, unusual backgrounds to, to getting to medical school. Um, and um, because of that, I am a co-founding um, team member of Elevation Med Prep, which is a platform that provides accessible um, application guidance to uh, people of all backgrounds. Um, I'll be talking a little bit more about this at the end. Um, and um, I'd be happy to, to take any questions about, um, you know, gap years or unusual um, paths to medicine or anything. Thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you all for those amazing introductions. Um, you know, taking a look at the agenda, I kind of want to switch it around because you guys all have such unique paths to medicine. So I think I want to start out with, is there a specific part of your background or upbringing that was really important to bring up on your application that you didn't realize was important until recently? And more specifically, I think that um, going through the application cycle myself this year, you tend to lose... Um, that aspect going through college of thinking about like, oh, I'm going to bring up like what I did in middle, middle school or like, you know, this random story that happened to me. So maybe we can go around and discuss kind of an integral part um, of your background that you didn't really think was important back then. Maybe we'll start out with Gabby. Yeah, um, I think like I guess this, I, I knew this was important to me, but I didn't realize how much I was going to talk about it on my application. And it was just like growing up in a different country and moving to the US. And like, I guess at the time when I didn't move here, I was 18 when I moved, I moved for college. And I didn't realize like how much you need to learn when you move to a different country. I mean, I knew it was a lot, obviously, but um like the types of things that you learn through that experience in terms of communication and like learning about yourself now that you're outside of the context that you're used to being in um and just like in a different culture that you grew up in um I didn't realize at the time how important that was going to be to the way that I, I saw myself and presented myself in my application and I did talk about that a lot and I think um it taught me important things that are relevant to medicine in terms of communicating with other people and learning how to navigate situations that aren't necessarily comfortable or situations that I'm not necessarily familiar with, how they should be going. And I think that was an important thing to talk about in my application that now looking back, yeah, like 
I, it, was a, it was a good way to communicate to admissions committees that I had learned something very specific through an experience that just like was the natural course of things. Like I moved here, I had to learn how to adapt. So yeah. Well, thank you. Maybe following on that path, um, Olamide, you can follow up. Yeah, sure. So I think it was two things for me that I was a little nervous about that I, since going through like medical school interviews as well as resident interviews now, I've actually found to be an asset. So one of them would be applying as an international student. So and I've always been interested in global health. I knew I wanted to eventually do some work in West African countries. And so when I was applying to medical school, I was a little nervous about that sharing, sharing that aspect. Because in my mind, I was like, how will they want to invest in education in me if I'm planning on you know, doing some work in West African countries as opposed to primarily being in the US. And I've actually found that for schools that do, um, that are blinded to the international student status, that was something they actually valued. And even for residency, that was a really huge part of my residency interview. Like that was a really huge part of the discussion. The other aspect I think similar to Gabby was the fact that um, when I moved here for college, I was also 15. Um, and so I often did not want to talk about that aspect uh, because I just felt like programs would think I was like immature. Um, but actually I found that since it comes up, like I guess they do the calculation and they realize that, um, they actually see the strength in that. And I found that that's something that actually strengthens my application and allows me to potentially get more interviews because they want to hear that story and want to see how all of those things came into play and how I've been able to like come to the US and how I've been able to um, you know, go to Dana Harbor for my gap years and what made me decide to do those things. So um, I would just say like, if you have those unique things, like I would hear on the, like, on the side of not being shy about them and actually talking about them and the schools that do value those things um, will not deny you an acceptance because of that reason. Awesome. And a quick follow-up question that someone asked in the chat, if you can answer it, is what patterns are you seeing right now that can be helpful for an international student? Um, I think the biggest thing that I we try to focus on, um, at least from all the other international students I've spoken to, is just making sure you're applying to the right places. And um, when I'm saying international student, I'm still talking from the perspective of someone who did do undergraduate degree in the US. So I'm not really sure how it works if you are if you did your undergraduate degree outside of the country. Um, but I know that if you did your undergraduate degree here in the US, there are some schools who blind um, the application selection and they don't really consider whether or not you're international or domestic student. So a lot of it is really just being selective about those schools and applying to those places as opposed to sending all of your applications to like state schools who by law, they're not allowed to accept international students. So I think it's really being careful about that and then you know doing all of the things you're supposed to do in the right ways. Um, and those are really the biggest aspects. And I'm happy to go into more details if you know details need to come up. Awesome, well, thank you. Maybe we can move on and Ariel, if you wanna answer um, the first question. Sure, yeah. And also if, <clears throat> excuse me, if anyone does have specific questions about students that are studying in either undergraduate or kind of undergrad graduate combined programs in, that are international, um, I might actually be able to help not from my personal experience, but from some um, close friends and family members that have been in that position that either are in medicine and wanna to come to the United States at multiple different levels or want to go into medicine here. Um, even though it's not my personal journey. Um, but back to the original question about kind of what characteristics that I realized were important later on for me when I was applying into med school was kind of like what's already been said, but not really being afraid to show who I am um, or who you are to the admissions committees um there was a lot of there was a lot of advice that i received about you have to make your story make sense to somebody else and you have to present it or you have to go do this activity in a way that admissions committees will understand and that never really felt or sounded right to me i was just kind of like but i'm living my life it's what i genuinely want to do it makes sense to me that's what should be important and so being able to recognize all these different intersectionalities that have made up my background and my experience 
that have come together that makes sense for me because that's what I personally care about. And I had to find a good way to be able to communicate that to other people. But the way that I kind of had to work on crafting things was on the ability to communicate what my actual experience was, not in crafting what my experiences were going to be based on what I thought somebody else wanted to see from me. And being able to have that confidence in sending off your application, I was definitely kind of nervous because I hadn't received a lot of kind of positive feedback or validation that that would work. But I decided, you know what, I just want to go for it because if this school doesn't want to have me for who I actually am, I don't really want to be there, um, which is scary when it's you think about how hard it is to get into medical school. Um, but honestly, it turned out so much better than I could have imagined. And I feel like it really both was good for me and like my confidence and my experience, but also it really helped me find the best match for me in terms of school and program. And so it turned out, I think, even better because of that. Cool. Well, thank you. And I think um, next, Danielle, when you answer this question, I got a specific message. If you can touch on mental health and, you know, if you want to bring that up, kind of where do you draw the line and how do you bring it up in a delicate way while, you know, respecting the fact of, you know, the time we're in now that it's appropriate to bring up, but still recognizing who is reading your application and not trying to make it, I guess, how do I say this the right way, but not problematic if some people might view it as that way. Totally. Um, yeah. So I, you know, when I was applying, this was in, I guess, 2014. So it's been some time. And I would say definitely at that time, like the number of people who told me do not mention that you've ever even thought you had depression or like a billion. Um, and I, you know, I, wa I wanted to listen to their advice, but I realized that I would just be lying through my teeth about why I wanted to do medicine, um, which I mean, was going to come off as incredibly in disingenuous. And I was literally going to have to like, just make up the story. Like it just wasn't going to work. Uh, so, you know, I said, I ultimately said like, you know, I was fortunate that at the time when I applied things about my you know, personal experiences and my like home life had improved a lot because I was living by myself for a while. And, you know, I had a, you know, a better friend support system and things like that. So when I applied, I was able to essentially, to be honest with you, make it a little bit more of a problem of my teenage youth than a problem that I, you know, had dealt with for a long time. And I would say that that, that is true in that as I got away from things that were difficult for me at home, it really became more anxiety, um, less depression, more anxiety. And I was able to find a, you know, an, a, a balance, maybe less so in college, but more so now in channeling that anxiety into productive energy. So I really you know, talked about it more as something I had overcome rather than something I was dealing with at the time. And I have to admit that, that I think that that is important. I will say that as an admission interviewer, uh, you know, I've, I've mentioned this a lot on my TikTok and stuff, but I've interviewed more than, you know, about a hundred folks. I was on the admissions committee for three years. And the number of people I actually saw come in and having talked about their depression, even in college, were way more than when, you know, than I can imagine uh, having been when I applied. So I will say that I would, generally speaking, I think that the medical field is changing their, the way that they think about this uh, because it's no hidden fact that you know, the, the rate of, of even physician suicide is very high. And so to just pretend like this isn't a problem is really dumb. Um, so you know, I think they're recognizing that, uh, sorry, that um, essentially you, know, you can't just wish the problem away. So they're, you know, encouraging or not encouraging, but they're, I think they're, they're increasingly more accepting of folks uh, who have dealt with that struggle because it's, it's all a struggle that a lot of people deal with. Um, and so I think that that's important. I also think that, you know, because it was a major part of my story um, in general, I, I did talk about how, like, for example, I, I was a volunteer at the crisis assistance line for like four years. And I was, you know, ma managing that line for a long time. And that was like one of my major, major volunteer experiences. And I think that like, honestly, you know, one of the best things I can think of for folks to, in, in conveying your story is 
to show that, you know, you had, maybe you had something personally affect you and that you did something about that, you know, to help other people. And that's kind of where that came for me was, you know, I knew what it was like to need to be on the other end of that call and to sit there and take those calls and be there for people um, was really empowering for me and is, is what, you know, kind of inspired me to, to go further into that. So yeah, it is a delicate thing and it's very personal um, to the individual circumstance, but I think in general, it, it can be done and, you know, it's better than lying. Uh, it's better than just having to make something up. So. Well, thank you for sharing. And I think it's important to point out how you mentioned you took the initiative to kind of act on, you know, your background and experiences by, you know, doing the hotline. You really took that um, experience and built on that. So thank you for sharing. Uh, maybe Jafar, you can um, finish up on this question for us. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, for me, I think um, I wish that I um, spoke a little bit more about the cultural differences that I had um, when I was applying. Um, I felt some pressure to conform when I was writing my application, I think, um, because I thought that's what um, the um, the people doing the reviewing applications were looking for. Um, but in hindsight, I should have stressed out um, or stressed more on the fact that um, that I come from a very culturally different place and um, could have tied that more in a way that um, shows that as a um, as a positive thing rather than a than a negative thing. Um, and then a little bit more non specifically, um, I think whatever like anyone decides to mention, I think it's really important to come up with a a really nice coherent story um, because if people are reviewing hundreds of applications, that's the one thing that will um, really make you stand out um, is if you have a, a memorable story. Um, so I think as long as something is incorporated in a way that is um, interesting and, and um, in a way that makes you stand out, then I think it's, it's worth mentioning. I think this is like the toughest part. Like how do you construct the story? What perspective do you take? Um, someone asked a question in the chat that I was hoping we can answer. So what do you think makes Yale Medical School and what they look for unique? I want to open it up to anyone who wants to ask a question first. Um, Ariel said something that was, that touched upon this. And this is both general and very specific to Yale, but like, it is true, like you should be honest in your application and do the activities because the activities that you chose made sense because like you wanted to do those things if you do the things that you want to do you will end up constructing a narrative because that's who you are you know you're just doing the things that you want to do the narrative is your story but uh, and it's important to be honest with that and I think for Yale specifically because there's the Yale system which is um basically like Yale's very free uh, in the way that we do like our, our education, like classes aren't mandatory. A lot of the things are optional. Um, like, I don't, I don't, I can't even remember how many mandatory events we had a week, like first year it was like one or two mandatory, like things that we had. It was usually like clinical skills and stuff that we had to like physically learn something. So like Yale, Yale does this on purpose in order to give students time to dedicate their days to things that they think are important. So like, if you have to go do research all morning and you can't go to class, that's fine. You just watch the lectures later. Um, and so if you do a lot of activities that are things that you're passionate about and you create this story, you show to Yale and all other medical schools, obviously, but specifically answering about Yale, that you can, like, you're very driven and you know the things that you want to do and you know the things that you're interested in and you're gonna use that time and that flexibility that Yale gives you in order to pursue those things. And I think those are the types of applicants that they're looking for. They're looking for people who take that flexibility and they can take advantage of it and actually like use that to do something that they think is important and like continue constructing their story as presented in their application. So I think that's like how all that ties back to Yale happy to hear other people's thoughts if they have other thoughts on that. Yeah, I'll just I second it. Oh, go ahead. Jamar. Oh, thanks. I can just add a little bit um, 
on that. I think because of the flexibility of the Yale system, it um, selects for a group of people that is, um, I think, um, more independent or people that really want to be here because or come here because they want to be here and not necessarily because someone has to tell them um, like where to where to go and what to do. And I think that's pretty unique because um, you end up with a with a cohort of classmates that is really um, really mature and really, really knows what they want to do. Um, and it's it's really nice to be around people like that. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I second totally what, what they said. Um, and I think that, you know, I'll just say that on the on the other side of this, right, because I've seen my classmates kind of go through all the medical school and stuff. And I will say that it's not, you know, the perfect place for every single person in the world. And I think that's that's what makes it specific is that, for example, I, I had a friend um, who, who famously to me said, you know, that he, he wished we had tests and like, you know, most, you, you know, yeah, you'd see my classmates, like most of us are like, no, like absolutely not. But someone who like my friend, he said, look, I mean, I don't really study if I don't have a test. And he didn't really, like he realized that about himself like later, he did totally fine. I mean, he got like a 260 on step and, you know, is, is now a neurosurgery resident. And so it's like, whatever, but he wanted that, right? And I was just like, okay, you know, that's, that's cool. But there may be somebody out there, right? Who really gets that, I don't know, just wants that feedback of that A or whatever of that slight edge of competition of measuring yourself. So um, yeah, you know, it, it, there, there are pros and we see a lot of pros and, but there are, you know, for certain people, there are reasons why it may not be the perfect place. Awesome. Well, thank you. I wanted to move um, into more of, I think um, Gabby spoke a bit about the activities. So I know a lot of times students believe you need to cover the big three research, clinical experience, shadowing to get into medical school. And as we can tell from all of your experiences, it's not just that. And I think sometimes the most important experiences are those that are not necessarily medically related. Um, so I wanted each of you to maybe expand on this and describe one experience in particular that was on your activities list that wasn't medically related, but that was integral to your personal growth and application. And also here, I want to note that, you know, students don't always have access to medically related experiences. So I want to highlight how there are um, various experiences out there and jobs that um, you can go into that have nothing to do with medicine. Uh, maybe Olamide, you can start us off. Yeah, sure. So um, I think I was pretty traditional. I listed the gap years and doing like the research stuff, um, also because of restrictions that you have as being on a visa. But um, I think probably one thing that I highlighted in my application was um, being a part of like volunteering at a playroom and not a, a playroom for like a homeless shelter. And I honestly didn't do this because of medical school. I only did it because I needed a hotline after work. And it ended up being one of the most significant experiences for me. And I spoke about it in the sense of realizing that we all have different identities and different aspects of like intersectionalism with our identities. And at the end of the day, what really matters to everybody is like that feeling of being accepted. And you really could see this even in children who are going through like really terrible um, things like being homeless. So I, I think that that came through my, like I wrote that as part of a secondary essay, like the diversity essay. And I think it was important to highlight that from the sense of this is what I've realized about my experiences and this is what I've seen people and relating that back to the fact that um, this is sort of what I want to do with my life, just ensuring that people belong in their home spaces. And I feel like on all of the interviews I went on to medical school and even residency now, I, I, I done research for two years and no one asked me about research. Like they wanted to know more about those personal experiences. A lot of the questions I got was like, how did you go from Nigeria to like a small school in Arkansas? Like, how did that happen? Like, what was this playroom experience like? What was that like? So they really were interested in more of those personal stories. So I think the more you can personalize it to like stand out from people um, and kind of shy away. Like I had maybe 40 hours of shadowing um, because that just wasn't available to me. And I ended up not, I, I don't think it ended up being a big deal um, to say. So I think a lot of it is just trying to find ways where you can stand out and it doesn't have to be like something dramatic um it just has to be honing your home story and talking about it 
Well, thank you. And I think what stuck out to me, what you said was um, you spoke about it in the sense, because I think everyone can have the same experiences or at the end of the day or volunteering at a soup kitchen, but it's how you talk about it yourself. Uh, maybe Gabby, you can uh, follow up. Yeah, um, one of the things I did in college was um, I played in a drumming group with some Brazilian kids. Um, we played like Brazilian music together. And I was one of the leaders of the group, like just like it wasn't an, a formal thing or anything like that, but it was a really cool experience. And I think I learned a lot about leadership and like how to not manage people, but like how to make sure that people that you are doing an activity with, like everyone's all right and like how everyone's doing. And it was a really cool experience. I mean, I loved it. I did it because I liked it a lot. Uh, like we would like play drums in the afternoon on a weekend or something and it was something that people asked me about a lot in my in on my interviews because they were like oh what was that like or whatever because I don't know it's just something I enjoyed doing and it again like taught me a lot about like relating to people and relating to people when you're trying to when you have a common goal of like playing music together and like um, you know being on the same page Another thing I will say though, and I know we're focusing on non-clinical activities. The only like thing that I will say is that I think some clinical activities are important just because, and this is not for like application purposes, but for you to know that this is really what you want to do. Cause med school is like, it's a, I don't know, this is news to no one, but medical school is like a big commitment. It's, it's kind of hard. So like, and make sure that like your clinical experiences don't do them just so they look good on your application. Like spend some time in the hospital, like if you have access to that or a clinic, just to make sure that this is actually what you want to do. Cause sometimes medicine is really cool on paper, but then you go and you do it and you're like, oh my God, I hate this. I feel like that that's very possible for it to happen to people. So just, just as like for yourself. Well, thank you. Maybe Jafar, you can go next. Yeah, so for me, um, I briefly mentioned this, but um, before even starting undergrad, um, I worked for, for two years. And for one of these years, it was um, at a, I worked at a dry cleaning place. Um, and um, I listed this on my application, and I didn't really think it would um, get any interest. But a lot of people just asked me about that, like why I did it, like how um, how did that affect me? And um, just, you know, people were curious about this because um, I think, you know, almost every applicant has like some some mix of like research or volunteering or shadowing experience. Um, and I thought it was really nice to be able to talk about that because I think it's, it, it, I did learn a lot from that about how to deal with people, just, um, just the way, because um, I was new to this country, just like a lot of the way things work here. Um, and, um, it made me realize that like, it's really, regardless of, of whatever experience that you have, if you, if it's meaningful to you and you list it and you explain why it's meaningful to you, I think people will um, be interested in it and, um, it'll be, it'll look good on your application. Thank you. Maybe Ariel can follow up next. Yeah, um, kind of like what Jafar was saying, I also, because I worked so many times basically from like high, during high school on um, while I was studying and when I wasn't, um, I did pretty much every service job known to mankind along with, um, you know, research and um, kind of like what Ola was saying, I had barely done any shadowing at all. Um, but the reason why I decided that I knew that I wanted to go into medicine, like what Gabby was saying was because I became an EMT, because I had realized that I didn't actually want to go into the legal field that I originally thought that I was going to uh, go to law school. Um, and so kind of piecing together the different parts of my journey and how they all informed each other to help me end up where I have ended up um, both help me figure out what I want to do for myself, kind of like what we were talking about before, but then also made sense as to why I was applying to medical school now, not in like a, you have to justify yourself kind of way, but as in like a, this is my story and here's how you can help get to know me kind of way. Um, and I, I think 
one of the really important parts of all this is because I, I had I was talking with someone who was applying to medical school at one point and they were kind of asking me like oh I'm doing this job but I don't feel like I'm getting that much out of it but I want to do this and almost kind of like asking me permission to stop doing an activity that was one of those big three um, from someone who was already in medical school and my response wasn't probably exactly what the person was looking for um, of not just like yes or no but I was saying if you want to stop this because you genuinely don't like it and you don't think there's anything more you can get out of it then go ahead but if and there's something else that you'd rather do instead then go do that but try to really think about why you actually like started doing this in the first place why you want to stop it what you would do otherwise or if you're just taking on too much and you just need to pair back to do a good job at whatever it is that you really want to focus on and not try to think about it as in like a check the box kind of thing um, but it, as in a what can I actually get out of this that will help either prepare me for my future career in medicine or help me confirm to myself that this is what I really want to do or some other lesson that you think is important or significant to learn from the things that you're participating in. That's amazing advice. <laughs> um, and maybe Danielle, you can finish us off on this question. Yeah, I'll just add something really quick because I kind of already touched on it, forgetting that we were going to talk about this as a separate question. But I think literally, like, I think at the time, I didn't realize how much that crisis response line volunteer work was useful for not just like literally because it was a good like it you know I, I felt very fulfilled doing it but because it's actually even though it's technically non-clinical it's extremely uh similar you know in a lot of ways to actually clinical because your entire goal on a call like that is someone's calling you in potential crisis they may not feel comfortable or feel safe calling you but they're calling you anyway and you need to essentially talk with them very openly try to get them to trust you, to talk to the, you about what they're dealing with. And then slowly, you know, by, by using literally the same types of interviewing skills that we learn in medical school about what is active listening, what is, you know, these different types of methods and styles of trying to, you know, help somebody who's coming to you in a, in a crisis, how to get them to just kind of, you know, uh, uh, be able to talk to you. And I had some really serious calls. I'll never forget once I had uh, like a homicidal caller with like a child in the car and like having to try to deal with an emergency situation like that um, while still maintaining like the trust in that person and trying to get, you know, them to kind of bring the situation down a little bit uh, was, was challenging, but again, had a lot of overlap. So I think essentially what I like to tell people is any experience you can you can find where your primary job is talking to people, especially if it's talking to people with like who are mad or have some kind of problem, right? Even like you know customer service, you know certain things like that has a lot of transferable skills in ways that you would never maybe think of at first, but then recognize that at the end of the day, your job as a physician is to you know, half of it is about seeing the person in front of you, you know, helping them to kind of confide in you, to trust you, to gain, gain that sense of, you know, mutual respect, and then helping guide them to make decisions for their own health in an informed way. And really, like I said, like, that's like at least half of the job. The other half is the science of it, the identification of these various things, the treatment, but really you don't get past anything if you can't get past that first you know, aspect of it. So, uh, you know, be creative. And, and I'm sure that there's lots of crisis assistance line type things. You know, we're overrun, right, with the pandemic with mental health crisis. So I'm positive that there's all sorts of national call centers out there looking for volunteers. So. Well, thank you for mentioning that aspect of communication, because I think that really helps answer a lot of the questions I get, which is like, you know, I just have to do this job because I need to make money and, you know, getting solace and knowing that you can really relate anything back to medicine because it all has to do with communication and interaction, I think is such an important point to bring up. Um, now moving, you know, being cognizant of the time, I wanted to um, ask Gabby quickly about um, her experience with gap year. Um, I know you did a master's, but maybe you can answer the question if someone's considering taking a gap year, what influenced your decision to take one? And how do you think that contributed to your application rather than just applying right outside of um, undergrad? 
Uh, I needed time. Like I really needed time. Like I wasn't ready to take the MCAT if I was applying the cycle before mine. And I also, I really liked the research that I was doing and I stayed at the same university for my master's and I kind of got to see through my project a little bit more and made it into like my master's thesis and stuff. So I wanted to continue doing that, but it was mainly time. Like I needed more time before starting medical school. And I've, I've noticed from a lot of my classmates that have taken time off that they've found it to be very valuable um, to be more prepared for medical school. Thank you. Um, and I wanted, someone asked a question in the chat that I wanted to bring up. It says, I had a hard time finding a passion or hobby when my schedule is so packed with classes. Um, do you have any recommendations? How do you find your passion or live outside your hobbies? If anyone wants to answer that. I can go for that one. Um, so it is absolutely true that scheduling and studying and all of that and whatever other obligations that you have to take care of can kind of drive out hobbies um, and or and or your passions. And I would say that that I was actually listening to um, a podcast um, from medicine the yeah, last night, and they were saying how even like for residents, they'll be like, do, do your classes and do your rotations and or do your research and study and take care of yourself and do your favorite things and take care of yourself some more and then get some sleep and get some exercise and kind of on and on. But remember to, you know, prioritize your self care. But actually research is really important too and make sure you study and et cetera. Um, and so I would say that there will be a time and a season for everything. So you don't have to just say, oh, I need a hobby. I have to do this right now there will be opportunities and times when things will become, oh, look, I do have this time to be able to pursue this thing that I'm interested in. And I would also say, don't be afraid to just try new things. You don't have to become the best at everything. You don't have to love everything that you do. You can try something, realize it's not for you. You can still learn something from that and then go and try something else and use something that you've learned about yourself or that you just happen to not like that one thing. And everything will kind of end up building upon itself. And especially when you kind of have that forced reflection in those application processes, if you kind of really take them for what they can be of an opportunity to reflect and take time to sit down and think about yourself and your, and your experiences, um, and not just, again, something that you have to complete because it's required of you. Um, that you can use to inform going forward. And I feel like in terms of finding something you're really passionate about, there are things that you think, oh, maybe I'll like this or maybe I won't, but you try it and suddenly it just clicks and you're like, oh my goodness, like this, I don't have to push myself to get up super early to get out of bed to go do this thing. Or I have a hard time keeping myself from doing this thing when I know I should spend time on other stuff. And it's frustrating and I know it's, <laughs> it kind of sucks to be just like, oh, you'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. Cause that's not sound, doesn't sound super helpful, but it will come with time. And just, there's a time and a season for everything. I like that, I wrote that down. <laughs> um, so I know we only have a couple minutes left. So I really wanted to answer this question because it's come up a lot. So maybe we can go around and say, do you have any advice for students applying during COVID? Um, what's your best piece of advice? So maybe we can start with Jafar. Yeah, so I'm really not familiar with um, applying during COVID, but um, from what I see, it seems like it's it's not easy. It's it's very challenging to come across as uh, personable sometimes over Zoom or you know to get a a, a good impression of um, the school or the program that you're applying to. Um, what I would say is because I've heard a lot of people say that they wish they knew this um, at different schools, is if you really like a school and you thought your interview went well, uh, try to make some time to like visit the, the, the school, visit the campus, just get a sense of whether you can live there for four or five, eight years, whatever um, it may be. Um, because I, I think, you know, being in a place where you, you you know, can tolerate living is 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 very important, um, and it's really hard to get that sense over Zoom. Thank you. Maybe uh, Gabby next. 
Um, I don't know much about applying during COVID, but for applications in general, reach out to the kids that go to that school. 100%, like 100%, like reach out to us. Like if you're thinking about going to Yale, if you got accepted and you don't know what to do or, and you don't know, like you're picking between schools, if you're just applying, reach out to the people that go there. Um, they'll be more than happy to talk to. And if they're not, that's also a sign. But they'll, they'll, most of the time, they'll be more than happy to talk to you and they'll really get you a sense of what it's like to go there because the admissions packets, they're gonna tell you it's great. But the, the, the people that go there will tell you what it's actually like. Thank you. Maybe Olamide, you can go next. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I think that also as an apply during COVID, but I think that um, obviously there's the the disadvantage of having to have less opportunities to like do risk like internships and things like that. But I think a lot of those same similar things follow, right? Like it's really just about creating a narrative that makes you um, interesting to people. To, and I think what another thing that we probably haven't touched on that I think is essential when you write your personal statement is saying, what you want to do with medicine. I feel like that really helps stand out. And you don't necessarily have to say, I want to be a pediatric cardiothoracic surgeon or whatever. Like it's more about what are the bigger pictures that you want to achieve with this. Um, I didn't know what specialty I wanted to do, but I had said, you know, what I hope to achieve. And I felt like that was something that was brought up that was unique for my personal statements. I think including that. I think a lot of it is also just realizing that, you know, you are on this journey for a reason. So just go for it. Don't allow anybody to tell you you can't do it. It's totally up to you and um, don't give up. Like there's going to be a lot of times where you feel as though you can't do it or there's something that makes you less than other people. Um, ignore um, all the negative aspects of Reddit and um, SDN and all that stuff. They are going to tell you some crazy things. Just focus on your journey and keep at it. And I, I think that as long as you're true to yourself, it all eventually works out, like it will work out. I'm glad someone else said not to go on Student Doctor Network. <laughs> um, maybe Danielle, you can go next. Yeah, no, actually definitely don't go on Student Doctor Network. That was like my main uh, source of information when I was applying because our my school didn't have a pre-med like committee at that point. Um, it, it was damaging for sure. No, it was not good. So that, that's actually part of what inspired me to, to start TikTok. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that my best advice is, well, I mean, just about getting a little bit creative about where you may be able to find some of these experiences, like some, some advice I've given to people is like, instead of wanting, instead of expecting that you're going to maybe be able to volunteer at a hospital, which usually has a lot more regulations and just, you know, paperwork and things you, like hoops you have to jump through, try asking a private practice physician, like just literally cold email or cold call. Um, you know, I have some videos on my page about, you know, how to do that, uh, you know, what, what you can ask, what you can say, but just, you know, go out on a limb. That's my best advice to anyone is I, I cannot tell you the number of times I've just, you know, just decided to send that email, just decide to ask and like been super surprised with people's responses, like in a good way. Um, worst case scenario, they don't email you back. They don't call you back. They say that they are not taking students right now, but um, just do it and you know, eventually you're going to get someone who says yes, because we've we've all kind of been in the position where we've needed to rely on others for help in order to get to where we are. Um, and, and, you know, whether it be in lab, teaching someone how to do stuff or, or in clinic, uh, being able to do that. So I think that's really important. Um, and then I think the other thing I'll just touch on a comment that was left for me in the in the, uh, in the question chats um, about like inappropriate questions during interviews. Um, I will say that, you know, me personally, uh, I wasn't really asked about the family question. I was asked a little bit more specifics about like kind of my, my home life experience with some, which sometimes got pretty, pretty intense. Um, I wouldn't say that, you know, because I was opening myself up to those, I, I did have to be prepared uh, to answer questions that were maybe feeling a little more invasive. Some of them more, were more along the lines of whether or not I was like you know, uh, since I had dealt with with a significant amount of like kind of trauma in my past and stuff, if whether or not I was like in a good in a good place now, um, and you know some of the ways that they asked that question varied. Uh, so being prepared, yes, that sometimes people, you know, even though you have certain questions that you're not supposed to ask, they can come up. I would say in, in particular for the family question, you know, if I were to be asked that right now, what I would personally say is like, you know, while that's not something that you know is is 
is something that I am thinking about particularly like right now in this moment that I know people or I've I've been aware of a lot of folks who who have made both work. You know, you can stay really broad and and just kind of say, you know, whatever and just kind of honestly bunt the question up because at you know, even if you don't personally, I will tell you a story right now. Uh, I know of a, a girl who, or a woman who has nine kids and just matched, you know, is matching into neurosurgery this year. You know, nine kids, like, whoa, like I can't imagine just having nine kids, much less then, you know, applying neurosurgery. Um, so, you know, now you know somebody who has nine kids and is applying neurosurgery. So she can do it, you can do it. You can just be like, you know, I know, I know somebody who, who did it. So it's all right. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> pretty I, cool. I, and Sorry, yes. I can also I can also add to that because I I did MD PhD application um and, as well, um and had some interesting questions asked occasionally, um and I would also just echo of you can still be respectful and say that you just are not exactly sure what your path will take. It's something that you know, you'll figure out down the line, you know, thank you for bringing up something that will be good for me to think about, but I don't necessarily have a great answer for you right now, even if you do, or if you just don't feel comfortable. I think that there's this fear of saying something that might not be what the interviewer wants to hear or what you think the interviewer wants to hear, but there's a value of being able to show that you can politely speak up for yourself and say what you need to say while still being really respectful. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And um, last but not least, I'm going to invite Jafar to speak a little bit more about um, his company, um, because I am also going to post it on the Discord and website, because it is amazing, and you should all know about it. So Jafar, take it away. Thanks, Jackie. So um, I briefly mentioned this, but I am a, a founding team member of Elevation Med Prep, which is a social enterprise that was um, uh, developed by Yale medical students and really focuses on uh, making medical school admissions more um, accessible to everyone. So what we do is we offer one-on-one um, um, -on -one, um, consulting services um, for, um, for, for the entire application process, including um, personal statement reviews, mock interviews, um, just general questions. And we also provide um, services like MCAT tutoring and really emphasize the um, the model that we use because um, we really try to make it um, you know um, we try to match um, students that have um, you know similar backgrounds or are facing you know similar um, similar paths to medical school because um, we feel that's a it's a much more um, it's a it's like a custom way to make the the application process a little bit more um, personable. So um, I put the um, flyer in the chat. And I'll also put um, our website in the chat if you want to sign up for our um, free newsletter or just to take a look at the, um, the services that we offer. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you all, and especially Jafar, you know, noting how it's really important how you showcase your background on these applications. You know, don't think that it's one size fits all with medical school. You know, that's why I had this webinar today and tomorrow to really showcase that, you know, your background and your experiences and what you're passionate about really matters. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, really speaking, you know, reaching out to anyone on these panels today or just speaking to more people is really gonna help you understand yourself better. Um, I know when I watch uh, Danielle's videos all the time, I just kind of take a step back and really think about like, you know, who am I and what am I passionate about and making sure I continue to do that. So I wanna thank you all again so much for, you know, really, you know, sharing your personal experiences both and professionally. I know I've learned so much from this discussion today um, especially um, Ariel for, you know, saying that one line, um, there will be a time and season. Um, please know that there will be a recording of this webinar on the Discord soon. Um, I look forward to interacting with everyone um, on STEM Potential and setting up additional events. I'm going to be reaching out to all the panelists today and seeing if they're comfortable with me putting up their contact information on our, on our website, so stay tuned. Um, as Gabby said, hopefully everyone will um, be comfortable with um, sharing their emails. 
we are done with the sessions for today, but please join us tomorrow. We have FAU, University of Miami, Duke, Harvard, and WashU. An amazing um, lineup tomorrow filled with MD, MD, PhD, MD, MBA, and MD, MPH. I don't know if I'm hitting all of it. I need to get more coffee in my system. Um, only had one cup today. Anyway, thank you all so much. Big round of applause for all the panelists today. Um, I really appreciate you taking this time out of your day, and I hope you guys all have a great night. So see you tomorrow.